Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. And I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we have a fabulous woman on who we've had on before who's written about um, motherless daughters and uh, a wonderful bestseller and now has come out with a brand new book where she's going to talk about after grief and finding your way through the long arc of loss. So I know, Heidi, uh, we're going to talk about that big question that people ask, aren't you over it yet? I love that question. People definitely ask me if I'm over my brother's death yet. And now if I'm over my father's death. So it's interesting how quickly people want you to say, yes, I'm over it. So we are going to be talking with our guest today about that and about her new book and about all the amazing things she's doing in the world and to bring hope to people. And how perfect is it that her name is Hope, which I absolutely mm -hmm. love. Uh, so Hope Edelman is the author of eight nonfiction books, including the bestsellers, Motherless Daughters and Motherless Mothers. She has been a sought after speaker and workshop leader for more than 25 years. Her most recent book is The After Grief, which offers a new way to think about loss. Welcome to the show, Hope. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Talk to us a little bit about what your take is on grief and loss now. I mean, you lost your mother how many years ago? Well, it's been uh, 39, uh, it'll be 40 years this July since my mother died. Right. What's your journey been? What's your arc? Well, you know, the, the question, are you over it yet, is actually not one of my favorite questions, although it's one that I hear a lot, and so do my clients. I'm a grief and loss coach, and I lead retreats and online support groups, and um, that's why the introduction to the after grief is titled Getting Over, Getting Over It, because I think we need to get past the kind of thinking that this is something that we get over or get past or put down or move on from. A major loss is something that we learn to carry forward with us. Ideally, with levity and grace, you know, without it weighing us down too much. And there are ways that we can um, uh, affect that or make that happen, and especially with the support of others. But my story is that I was 17 when my mother died of breast cancer, 1981, no grief support available for families at that time. We were left to figure it out on our own. So I did, I muddled through the rest of my adolescence, young adulthood, into adulthood, became a mother myself. And along the way, I wrote the book Motherless Daughters because I was reading, meeting other women who had also been profoundly affected by early mother loss mm -hmm. and found that we had a lot in common. But I think of the after grief as motherless daughters for grownups in a sense, because I was so young when I wrote that book. Dang. I was only 28, 29 when I wrote Motherless Daughters. I still had so much ahead of me. Mm -hmm. A lot of big life transitions, marriage, motherhood, turning and passing the age my mom was when she yeah. died, which is a significant silent yeah. transition for, mm -hmm. mother, for anyone who's lost a parent. And as the decades unfolded and I saw how the loss continued to affect me in ways that I felt were both bad and good, if we could use those simplistic terms, <clears throat> I was looking back now over the whole arc of my experience. And that's what the after grief is about. It's about what loss looks like 10, 20, 30, 40 years later as we carry the memory of those loved ones mm -hmm. and the memory and the experience of their death forward with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that you're doing this because just ironically, as I was getting really wrapping myself around this new book, uh, made me think about my own class at Columbia that I teach and I started teaching it three years ago and it's called Traumatic Loss During Childhood. And, and, and I designed it. And what it is, is looking at people that have, like you, that have had losses when they were children and how it's impacted them over their life course. Wow. And that is what you have done. Mm -hmm. That is what you are doing. And that is what you have interviewed people about, which I yes. love because yes. people don't understand that even though my brother died 35 years ago, his life profoundly impacts me today. And as you've said, in your interviews, not necessarily just in bad ways. 
Exactly, exactly. Now, most of the interviews that are being done, or I'm sure you're finding in your class that a lot of the research that's been done on traumatic loss during childhood interviews adults who are looking back retrospectively or interviews the children themselves without a sense of what, what it will look like for them 10 or 20 years later. There were no longitudinal studies that track that I could find that tracked people over 20 or 30 years for good reasons, right? It's hard to fund a study for that long or keep people in a study for that long. But as Gloria was saying, I had this extraordinary opportunity mm -hmm. to re-interview 15 of the women who had originally participated in motherless daughters in the early 1990s. So we captured a snapshot of their story and their perception of events when they were in their 20s or 30s, many of them. Back then, it was 1992, 1993 when I did those interviews. And then 26, 27 years later, I caught up with them again and asked them to tell their story now as they would tell it, which was longer and richer and fuller. And I had an opportunity to see which parts of their story had remained the same and their points of view and which had changed. And that was fascinating to see how their perspectives had shifted over time because that to me is the most extraordinary part of the after grief. It's how our relationship to the same set of facts changes mm -hmm. as we move and pass through different periods of our own life and different phases of our own development. What were some of your major takeaways from uh, these interviews? Well, a lot of these women who were in their 20s at the time, maybe had lost their mothers when they were children or teenagers, were still in very black and white thinking. You know, we're still thinking very much like um, my mom died and it was unjust and unfair and and my dad was the villain or my stepmother was the villain or, you know, there was a lot of anger still and um, confusion about how they had been treated. What I did find often was that later in life, they could look back and say, my gosh, my dad was only 38 years old when, my, when he lost his spouse and he was left with three kids and he was grieving himself. Of course, he was going to make mistakes. He didn't know he didn't have support. You know, they could feel compassion for the adults who had cared for them. Whereas when they were younger and their expectations and needs weren't met, they felt deprived and angry. But also becoming a parent for those who had become mothers themselves really shifted their perspective because they were able to understand their mother's experience through the eyes of a mother in a different way. And that often created a very bittersweet kind of experience for them because they felt like, wow, my mom really loved me and wow, how sad that she had to leave, you know? Now, what was your perspective on that? How did it change yours? And did hearing those stories bring up some things for you? Well, I had experienced a lot of that myself and I'd been writing about it and, and processing it, but I was surprised by how consistent it was among the interviews. And something else that really surprised me doing these interviews was how that first interview factored into their stories now how it was a really important inflection point. They identified it as a, a moment in their journey when they started healing, because for the first time, someone had given them permission to tell their story and they had sat down and shared a narrative and it, they put it together in a way for an audience of one, that was me, the interviewer, that made sense and they got new meaning from it. And they felt that that had been a really important part in their own journey. That I had not expected, but it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So permission to tell the story, that's really an interesting thought. And I, I want to just mention this idea of silent transitions, because it seems to me that one of the things that your book is going to do is helping people not to have those transitions be silent. Oh, I hope so. that's what I hope. Yes, I hope. Because right until now, let's just use, for example, my mom was 42 when she died. So as I approached 42, reached 42 and passed 42, it was a very, very significant internal rite of passage for me. But it wasn't acknowledged really by any kind of larger cultural support or community. Only other women who had lost their moms could understand why this was so important and significant to me. So, oh yeah, at theaftergrief.com, we're about to put up templates for various rituals so that people ha can create ceremonies to acknowledge a death anniversary, especially a significant one, like the first, the 10th, the 25th, mm -hmm. and also a ceremony to um, 
celebrate doesn't sound like the right word, but I think acknowledge, commemorate that rite of passage. I'm doing a free live event next Sunday just on this because the community has been asking for it because women approach that age with a lot of trepidation. You know, they're afraid that history might repeat, right. that they might die at the same age that their mom did. And then on the other side of it, they have this feeling of exhilaration, like I made it, you know, I'm in the bonus years now, but also this sense of sadness or almost survivor guilt. Like my mom didn't get to see these years. How come I did and she didn't kind of, there's a lot that goes on. You know, yeah, it's interesting when you say that because one of the things that I've noted uh, 10 grandkids that uh, my son was 17 when he was killed. And I've noticed that people, my daughters are uh, commenting on they're happy to see their uh, children go through the 17th year, correct, Heidi? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. I, I mean, my, especially, I was very anxious when my son was going to turn 17. I didn't, I wanted him to skip that year. Yeah. You know, I was worried that what if something happened to him when he was 17 and it was so, I knew it was irrational, but I, it was a, it was a very real fear. Yes. And when he turned 18, I breathed, breathed a sigh of relief because he was still here. It's called an age correspondence mm -hmm. event in psychoanalysis. And I felt the same way when my daughters turned to 17, because mm -hmm. there was a part of me that felt like, please, God, just let me live long enough to okay. get them to 17, because then I know they will be okay, because mm -hmm. I was okay. Okay being a relative term, of course. But um, when my younger daughter turned 17, I remember having this moment feeling like my work is done. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. She doesn't need me anymore, which was absurd because, of course, she was texting me three times a day with questions. Yeah. But, you know, it, you're right. It's not rational. It's not intellectual. It's deeply emotional, deeply yeah. emotional. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it happens at the spirit level, too, because, you know, we're still very connected to those loved ones. So, so Hope, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what is, you were so young losing your mom and you've gone through your entire life interviewing people and without your mom. What are some of the hardest things about losing a mother? Well, so much depends on how the family supports the children afterwards. In fact, almost all of the literature supports that the response of the surviving caregivers is just as important and sometimes more important to the child's long-term adjustment than the fact of the death itself. Mm -hmm. So the, the children, and this also depends on the child's age and temperament and developmental period, but that generally speaking, children up to age 18 who have a consistent, warm, loving adult who will talk with them about what happened and help them process their emotions will adjust better over the long term than those who are shuffled around from family to family or who have a parent who is impaired by their own grief or an addiction or a mental illness and, and can't be there for them. Children are remarkably adaptable. They will often find someone who can help them through it, but many don't and they have to learn how to rely on their own resources. They develop coping strategies that get them through those tough periods. But then a lot of those women will come to a motherless daughter's retreat and say, these, these survival strategies that worked so well for me for so long, I feel like they're not working anymore. In fact, now they're kind of working against me. Like I had to learn to take care of myself. I became hyper independent, mm -hmm. but now I want to have an adult romantic relationship and I'm so independent. I can't ask for help or I can't trust anyone or I'm having trouble in the workplace and, and I feel stuck. I don't know how to undo that. So, um, there, there are ways that we can go back and revisit those coping strategies. We can thank them for helping us. Mm -hmm. as well as they did, we can release them and, and then try out you know, other strategies that might be more advantageous to us as adults, but that's a process. I um, would think that one of the big issues, and maybe I'm just guessing for uh, people who've lost their mothers is bringing in another woman into the relationship. Well, if a child is young and loses a mother to death, uh, a father tends to remarry more quickly that a widower will remarry more quickly than a widow that is known statistically speaking mm -hmm. and he will often do that um, to have help if there's multiple young children um, yes the stepmother stepdaughter relationship when a mother has died is often a uh, fractious one mm -hmm. and that is not to say that there aren't remarkable relationships that can develop of real genuine closeness and affection but um, stepmothers who come into a family with grieving children um, and just want to, you know, when the, 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 the new couple just wants to create a new status quo where everyone is happy and, and yeah. cohesive 
and doesn't meet or attend to the needs of the grieving child is setting up a situation for distress in that child. And that's often what I see many years later in the adults that I work with. Mm -hmm. And how about you? Did it work out that way with you? My father never been married. Okay. Well, I don't have the experience yeah. of having had a stepmother. Um, all of my insight into this is purely anecdotal. Um, mm -hmm. I wish my father had remarried for his own happiness, but I'm also aware um, that there could have been you know, conflict or distress in the family as a result for all the reasons I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also That's think since you didn't have a mother, the mother in your life anymore, that one of the things that might, was probably hard when we're looking at it from a longitudinal, you know, over time, was when you had your own children, you couldn't go to your mother right. and ask her any mother parenting questions or, you know, advice. That's or, right. You know, That's right. And that was, and that was profound for me. I was 33 when my uh, first daughter was born. And you would think that someone who had been writing and speaking about mother loss at that point for a solid five years would have been prepared for the grief response I had. But that falls into the category in the after grief that I call new old grief, which is when an old loss shows up in a new way. Mm. And what that means is that I could not grieve the absence of my mother as a granddaughter for my daughter, a grandmother for my daughter or an, an aide to me as a new mother until I got there. There was no way that I could grieve the absence of that at 17. There was no way I could even grieve that when I was pregnant. It wasn't until my daughter was there and I've got this little screaming thing in my arms and I feel completely incompetent. And I, I want, you know, longing for an older woman to tell me what to do and how to be a mom and wanted to know what I was like as an infant and how she handled mm -hmm. infant care and she wasn't there that I had a grief response. But I will say, I did have a wonderful cousin who, who was a motherless daughter herself, who mm -hmm. flew in from Australia to help me for the first oh, few weeks. Yeah. My mother-in-law came a few weeks later and she helped out. And when my second daughter was born, I hired a postpartum doula. Mm -hmm. And I can't recommend that enough because she came in and the doula, the postpartum doula comes in in the um, afterbirth period right. to take care of the mother so the mother can take care of the child. I and I really that. felt well cared for. She, her name was Tracy, I'll never forget her. She was wonderful. I could only afford her like three hours a day for a couple of weeks, but I lived for those three hours a day. She was really wonderful. And so she- Finding trusted advisors, finding other people in your life that you can bring in, it sounds like, for help. Yes, you have to build a team. Mm -hmm. Build a team. Love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna say one thing from here. Um, I'm hearing you talk about what your mother would have been and what she would have done. And I am like, as a mom, wow, she really has got an idealized picture of what her mother would sure. have done and could have been. You got to sure. build a team in your life. It doesn't matter whether you, exactly. <laughs> mothers <laughs> aren't everything. Had, had my mother lived, she probably still would have been living in New York or Florida by that time with her friends. <laughs> I'd be in Los Angeles and would she have flown out to help me? And would she have been healthy? And would she have offered me the kind of support? No, it was a complete fantasy, of course, but it was based in some reality. I mean, I had a really loving, good mom, yeah, but, yeah. but a lot of women don't. You know, I have friends who gave birth and thought their mom was the last <laughs> and they wanted to come help them during that time. And you yeah. know, you acknowledge that that exists as well. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, well, I love what you're doing and give us your website and your book and everything about you and all your workshops. And because you know what I'm loving the very, very most about this is you are taking the implicit and bringing it explicit. You're bringing it out. You're saying, let's look at these uh, silent transitions, you know, let's acknowledge them and just bring them out in the open. It, it, it's a great service. Right, and let's talk about it and create community so we don't feel like we're experiencing this in isolation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, love it. So give us your uh, site and everything. www.motherlessdaughters.com. This is great timing because weekly motherless daughters community calls are starting in February. Low cost every week, drop in for the subjects that are of interest to you, meet other motherless women and, uh, and get support. And um, also hopeedelman.com has all of my coaching information as well. All right. Well, thank you, Hope. You're amazing. And uh, we love what you're doing. We do. Thank you so thank much. You. Love your work as well. Longtime fans. Thank <laughs> you, Hope. And thank you for building awareness about the fact that our grief doesn't have a beginning or an end. It transforms. It goes in circles. And 
Yeah. Yes, it goes in circles. I love yeah. this. And we grow in profound ways after our losses. And I know that you've talked about that a lot on the interviews you've done. So thank you so much. You're so very welcome. And thanks everybody for joining us on the show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.